Okay, so you've probably heard of Peru. There's a popular one, you know, llamas, Machu Picchu, ceviche, the Incans. But what you probably don't see too often is the larger scope of what Peru has become in modern times. It's this deserty, mountainy, jungly, Asian-fused, West Coast business-oriented chef of the Latin world. Yeah, chef. No one cooks like Peruvians, and they'll Peruve it to you. Yeah, there you go. That's my pun for the episode. <sighs> It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. Geography Jorge Carlos says, Peru is a beggar sitting on a gold bench. There's lots of stuff to deal with, yet so many riches they have. And now it's time to open the treasure map and find the pot of gold, shall we? In South America, location matters. Everybody wants two things, resources and ocean. Shut, Shut up. up. And if you can have both, plus some really cool straw hats, you're probably gonna do well. First of all, the country is located on the west coast of South America, bordered by five countries. The nation is further divided into 24 departments, each with their own flag and seal. The capital and largest city of the country is Lima, which also acts as its own department. Within the large Lima city limits, though, lies a special administrative division, and the smallest one, known as the Constitutional Province of Cayo. This little guy actually actually holds the biggest and busiest airport, Jorge Chavez International, which even though technically is not part of Lima, is considered Lima's airport. Just a skip away, you can also find the largest and busiest shipping port, the Port of Cayo, where most major cargo ships dock and transport traded goods. Speaking of the coast, down at the bottom of Peru, they have a slight maritime dispute with Chile, which kind of looks like this, but it doesn't really cause too much trouble. Just a few fishing vessels might have a skirmish or two. Peru doesn't really have many islands off its coast. However, the largest one is actually not too far off from Lima, San Lorenzo Island, which is actually closed off to the public and controlled by the Peruvian Navy. After Lima though, the second largest city is Arequipa down south and a bit inland, which holds the third busiest airport, Rodriguez Bayon International, and then Trujillo makes up the third largest city further up north along the coast. You might be wondering, what's the second busiest airport? Well, due to high numbers of tourists flocking in to see the ancient Incan sites like Machu Picchu, it's actually Cusco's Alejandro Velasco Astete International Airport. Otherwise, about 86% of the population lives either within the coast or mountains, and only about 10% in the rainforest to the east. This means that the road network is built accordingly, and many of the secluded areas inland, like Iquitos, the capital of the Loreto department, have no land transport, and they are only accessible by air travel or painstakingly long river boat journey. And that's the funny thing. Peru is incredibly lush and green on the interior, but most people prefer to live in the dry, deserty coast. I guess that's good, though. I mean, less people means less deforestation. For what it's worth, though, there's another way you can look at Peru. Historically, Peru was the epicenter of the Incan Empire, which had quite a wide network of roadways, about 25,000 miles long. That connected the entire domain that extended all the way from Ecuador to Argentina, spanning about 177,000 square miles. These paths followed the Andes mostly, and were built in a unique system that allowed porters, called chasquis, to literally run and relay items or information or messages to other chasquis from coast to mountain. Along the way, they would sometimes take pit stops at small houses known as tambos that provided shelter and food to rest. Soon, the next chasquis would have to keep running and fulfill the delivery. This porter system could sometimes cover over 150 miles a day, all without a single wheeled vehicle or even horse. The wheel had never even been invented at this time, and the only animal of burden was the llama, which could not carry adult humans, let alone run with them. Yet a wealthy or royal family living in Cusco could still have fresh fish caught from the ocean delivered to them all within two days. Not bad. Yeah, literally just people running on foot. It worked somehow. And speaking of Cusco, Peru has quite a lot of cool places to check out in case if you decide to visit, 12 of which are UNESCO heritage sites. Yeah, 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 we've all heard about most of the Cusco and Machu Picchu stuff and these other ones that have too many tourists. However, in addition, there are these lesser known but equally fascinating sites. This one, you're kind of supposed to pronounce it like sexy woman. Sexy woman. There's also so many famous cathedrals and museums like these. There's also the Lake Titicaca floating village shared with Bolivia. The Sky Lodge adventure suites. The last Incan grass bridge. Salt pans of Maras. Rinconada, which claims to be the highest city in the world. There's even a statue dedicated to Paddington bear, and the giant hat building in Celedin. And there's so many natural wonders in Peru as well. For crying out loud, they have a rainbow mountain, the world's tallest sand dune, third tallest waterfall in the world, the largest left-handed wave in the world, and a boiling river. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Stuff like that belongs in the next section. The... Earth. Fire. Wind. Water. The rest. Animals, resources, or whatever. With your powers combined, I am Captain Peru. And you guys remember that show, 90s kids? No? Yeah? yeah. 
Whatever. First of all, the country sits right at the ring of fire at the convergence of the Nazca Plate under the South America Plate. This convergence is essentially how the Andes Mountains were formed, the second tallest range on Earth after the Himalayas. In addition, it creates the Peru-Chile Trench just off the coast, which also makes the country pretty susceptible to earthquakes and some volcanic activity. The nation is generally divided into three physical zones, the Costa, Sierra, and Selva. The coast is mostly dry and desert-like with arid vegetation. In fact, the driest desert in the world, the Atacama, hugs the southernmost tip of Peru. The next part, the mountains, or Sierra, takes up about 30% of the land, and of course is made up of the highest parts of elevation, including the tallest peak of the nation, Mount Huascaran, with its two majestic peaks. Just to skip south, you find the largest lake, not only in Peru, but all of South America, the highest navigable lake in the world, Lake Titicaca, shared with Bolivia. It is also in this region that the longest river, not only in Peru, but also all of South America, begins the famous Amazon, which branches out into thousands of other tributaries and streams, but surveyors claim that the source of the Amazon are the headwaters of the Mantaro River, which is sourced at Lake Junin or Chinchaycocha. The last physical region, the Selva, or rainforest, makes up about 60% of Peru's land makeup and is sparsely populated and filled with all that lush, green, humid, tropical forest stuff that you can imagine. As we explained in the Chile episode a long time ago, the reason why the country is like this is essentially because of the rain shadow effect. The winds carrying moisture are trapped in by the mountain ranges, leaving all the leftover dry air to blow out westward on the other side, parching the land and leaving it to form a depleted, arid landscape in contrast to the adjacent region. Oh, and one more thing, the warm waters off the coast are also the source of El Nino, the crazy weather pattern in the Pacific that causes all the tropical storms and whatnot. Phew, and with that being said, it's time for my triple shot espresso break, which means now it's time for Noah to finish off this segment with the physical composition of Peru. All in a day's work. As mentioned, Peru is home to a wide range of flora, fauna, and overall physical contrast. They are classified as a mega-diverse nation with nearly 6,000 endemic species. They have about 1,800 bird species, including the largest flying bird in the world, the giant Andean condor. In addition, there's also 500 species of mammal, including the national animal, the llama. And about 300 species of reptiles and over 15,000 plant species, including the Puya Rayamondi, the world's tallest flowering plant. And speaking of plants, the potato originated here in Peru, and they come in over 4,000 different varieties, colors, and shapes. Peru is the world's largest quinoa and maca producer. They also produce the world's most expensive coffee, Kawadi Dung Coffee, which is made from the partially fermented coffee beans that pass through the digestive system of a Kawadi. Wait, so you're saying this whole time my espresso breaks could have been Kawadi poop coffee breaks? I want that. How much is it? Well, once a limited supply of beans are harvested and produced, I mean, come on, Kawadis can only poop so much, they can sell for up to $1,400 per kilogram. Worth it. Otherwise, resources have always been a key player in Peru's economy, specifically in the mineral mining industry. They are the world's sixth largest gold producer and which in itself makes up over a fifth of their exports. Service sector jobs have greatly increased, especially in the transport category. Largest company in Peru is actually Aero Condor. And finally, time to bring this segment to a close like we always do. Food! In the Latin world, Peru is a culinary powerhouse. Often some of the top ranking restaurants in the world are found in Peru like Central or Maido. Some top notable dishes that you guys suggest we mention include things like Lomo Saltado, Arroz con Pato, and Ticuchos, Rocoto Relleno, Aji de Gallina, Alpaca and Llama Meat, Lucuma and Camu Camu Fruits, Papas a la Huancaina, and the national dishes, Ceviche, most of you may have heard of this, and the lesser known, Cui, which is roasted guinea pig. Yep. Guinea pigs, that's also a native animal. And you know what else is native? The people. Which brings us to... Thank you, Noah. This is great poop coffee. When you think of Peruvian people, you think ponchos, pan flutes, and those hats they wear. Yeah, there are some people like that in the country, but that's only one fraction. Peru is pretty much like all the other nations in the Americas. It has a story rooted in both native and foreign fusion. Today, Peru, much like its cuisine, has a little bit of everything blended into it, but never compromising the foundation of where everything got started. And it's gotten pretty Asian. First of all, the country has about 33 million people and is the fourth most populous nation in South America. Coming up with the exact numbers for ethnic breakup is a little tricky because not all the census data seems to match up exactly. However, according to CIA World Factbook, the highest percentage of the largest group, Mestizos, numbers at about 60%, and the Amerindian community population is supposedly at around 25%. However, some estimates I've encountered claim as high as around 46%, so the exact number may vary. Either way, the largest groups of this category are Quechua and Aymara. Around 6% of the population are white, around 4% are black, a little around 3% are Asian, mostly Japanese and Chinese, and the remainder 
are unspecified groups at around 2%. And here's the weird thing though. According to certain studies, it is speculated that historical intermarriages between Asians and locals dating back to the mid 19th century means that somewhere around 10 to 20% of the entire population could have East Asian roots down their lineage at some point. If this were true, it would make Peru potentially the most Asian of all the countries, not just in Latin America, but all the Americas. Yeah, I told you, those Asians left their mark for sure. Mostly the Japanese. I mean, after Brazil, they have the largest Japanese diaspora in the world, and even one of their presidents was Japanese. It didn't go so well for him, but hey, it shows how far the Japanese have come in Peru. Anyway, they use the Peruvian soul as their currency, they use the type A and B plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now back to people groups, the country kinda has like three official languages. Of course, Spanish, and then there's Quechua, and finally Aymara, which is actually more spoken in Bolivia. In the shortest way to put it, the Quechua and Aymara are basically the largest groups of modern descendants of the ancient Incan peoples. Most of them live in the high mountains of the Andes, which means their bodies from a young age have actually acclimated to the rather intense conditions of thin air and cold. The average Quechua and Aymara person has a slower heart rate, a third larger lung capacity, and more blood volume. Dude, they're kind of like superhuman. Kind of, yeah. By force from birth. I, I guess, kind of, yeah. Cool. Forced superpowers. Uh, if it'll help you remember that fact, then fine. Any per who? The indigenous, although a vital part of the Peruvian identity, are only one part of the puzzle, though. There's so much to discuss with the people, and with that, here's Random Hannah with Culture Stuff. <laughs> Today, with generations of multicultural backgrounds, the population of Peru is very different from how it started centuries ago, yet they never lost their roots. As mentioned, historically, the Incans created an entire complex society of millions, all without the advantages that were used in Western societies. According to Atlas Obscura, the Incans never invented the wheel, never figured out the arch, and never discovered iron, but they were masters of fiber. Everything from ships, armor, slings, and bridges were made of fiber one way or another. Another. They even had a system of communication with knotted fibers called quipus. Otherwise, today traditions still live on in the indigenous communities. For one, Quechua women that are married often wear various types of woven hats, whereas single women wear knitted hats. Catholicism, of course, plays a huge role as well. Somewhere around three-fourths of the country claim to be affiliated to it. Catholicism in Peru, though, has a high degree of synchronism. For example, many herders from the countryside still pay tribute to Pachamama or Mother Earth. For many of these peoples, traditional belief systems in themselves are still practiced even apart from Catholic fusion. In fact, Peru has the second highest number of shamans after India. And now we're going to do a list of some cultural stuff, but to help me, we're going to bring out... Ian! Oh. Oh. All right, we're back at it. You know what to do? Yep, all right. <clears throat> ah, they're so cute! In addition, festivals in Peru are world-renowned and famous for their intense, colorful displays. Festivals like Capac Cola, which is a sort of rite of passage for boys. There's also the scissor dance, Das Sante de Tejeras. The festivals of the sun, Inti Raimi. Holy Week is a huge deal and probably the most colorful and famous one, the La Candelaria Festival held in February. In the end though, no matter what part of Peru they're from, everyone knows the song Contigo Peru. It's practically a second anthem for them. It can literally stop fights. The festivals are, of course, riddled with so much food, colors, and music, which of course brings us to Keith's absolutely terrible, horrible music segment. Musica Paraguano! Oh, Peruano! When you think of music in Peru, immediately, most people just think pan flutes, pan flutes, and pan flutes. Pan flutes are a huge part of their musical culture, but there's a ton of other traditional instruments. One of the most commonly used ones is the charango. Charanango? You said it right the first time. Okay. Which looks like a ukulele, but has a different structure and sound. Otherwise, apart from the traditional sounds over time, music in Peru evolved into something very special. The many people groups all came together and fused their influences in each region kind of has its own specialty. For example, you have Creole music, mostly along the coast, which has lots of influence from the Afro-Peruvian community. They use the cajon a lot. Peru was one of the leading founders of exotic cumbia, which fuses traditional and Amazonian rhythms with Spanish melodies. Everyone knows that song, El Condor Pasa. Simon and Garfunkel even did a cover of it. And that's about it. Remember, buy a key shirt at geographynow.com because 
This shirt is the shit. Thank you, Keith. Yes, buy a shirt at geographynow.com. Now, there's a lot of other things we could have mentioned, like often when drinking beer, they leave a little left in the glass and then pour it on the soil to give back to Mother Earth. There's those long skulls of the Paracas, which are brought up a lot in alien conspiracy theories. But anthropologists say that people would just kind of push their baby skulls in between long boards to make that shape for aesthetic reasons, symbolizing nobility. They do have a long history of political strife. I mean, the past five presidents are either dead or in jail. And finally, almost every Peruvian has told me, we hate Senorita Laura. Don't mention her. She is a national disgrace and she was exiled. She's Mexico's problem now. Yeah, thanks, Peru. In any case, now it's time to do the incredibly condensed history section. In the quickest way I can put it, pre-Incan civilizations. Incas. Conquistadors come in. They fight the Incas. Amaru the Second Rebellion. Vice royalty years under Spain. Wars of independence for all of Latin America. San Martin versus Bolivar. Guano era. Ramon Castilla abolishes slavery. War of the Pacific. Foundation of APRA. First military dictatorship. Democratic elections. Second military dictatorship. Agrarian revolution. Democratic elections. Support to Argentina during Falklands War. Terrorism and economic crisis. War with Ecuador. The Four Suyos March. Pan American Games in Lima. And here we are today. And now it's time for the extremely condensed notable people section. Some people you guys, the Peruvian geography people, suggested we mention in this episode include so many soccer slash football players, but this one is probably the most famous. War heroes like these people Tupac Amaru II, Pachacuti, Atahualpa, these two saints, Juan Diego Flores, Susana Baca, Eva Ayon, Chabuca Granda, the whole women's volleyball team that won the silver medal in the Olympics in Seoul, Edwin Vasquez, Sofia Mulanovic, Benoit Piccolo, Gladys Tejeda, Ines Melkor, Valentina Shevchenko, Ricardo Palma, Cesar Vallejo, Maria Vargas Llosa, Claudia Llosa, and Daniel Peredo. All right, and that's just about it. And now we will talk about Peru's relations with the outside world, shall we? In the Latin world, Peru is like that neighbor that everyone wants to visit when they are having a barbecue. Like when Peru starts cooking, suddenly cousins you didn't even know you were technically related to start popping up. It's like, what the, Cape Verde, really? I mean, you're invited, but dang, it's been a while. You don't even speak Spanish. For one, they generally get along with all their South American cousins. Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador are like the fun cousins. Brazil is like the business cousin, and Chile is like their biggest frenemy, you know, because of the War of the Pacific. But they still get along with Chile and love to visit. Geography Nicholas says, all the best restaurants in Chile are Peruvian and the best stores in Peru are Chilean. They both argue about the drink Pisco Sour being their national drinks, but otherwise they moved on and do well together. China and Japan are of course their best Asian friends. China is actually their biggest trading partner in both imports and exports, and the ties go all the way back to the 1800s when the Chinese migrants to the New World began through cheap labor workers after slavery was abolished. In 2009 they signed a free trade agreement, and today Peru hosts the largest Chinese community in Latin America. Relations with Japan however go even earlier during the Manila Galleon years, in which ships would transfer peoples and goods back and forth from the Americas to the largest Asian Spanish colony, the Philippines. Japan often got involved and eventually was exposed to Peru. Since then, heads of state have constantly visited, bilateral agreements signed, many Japanese companies operate hubs in Peru, and the two are always close. In terms of their best friends, however, most Peruvians I have talked to have said, depending on who you ask, it would probably be Argentina and Bolivia. Even though they don't border Argentina, they've always kind of kept an eye on each other, business is always usually good, and Peru totally supported Argentina in the Falklands slash Malvinas War. They are part of numerous organizations like the Latin Union, the Union of South American Nations, and so on. Culturally though, Bolivia seems to tie in better with the indigenous community as both countries have high populations of Quechua and Aymara groups. At one point they were even joined together under a confederation for three years back in the 19th century. Bolivia shares the same Incan blood as they were both historical centers of the famous empire prior to Spanish rule. They will forever be mountain brothers. In conclusion, Peru has gone from an empire that thrived on foot speed, fibers, and festivals, and now it's fusion finance and food. Take a seat and enjoy the barbecue because Peru serves up quite a dish. Stay tuned, the Philippines is coming up next. Bye bye.